Greetings all, this is Harry Nick, and welcome to my totally, utterly spoilery review of The Last Jedi. I am joined by someone that is not Justin. No, I am not Justin. Excellent, excellent. Moving on. No, no, uh, I will say, this is Matt. Hello. How you doing, dude? I'm good, how are you? Excellent. Now, for those of you who don't know, I've mentioned it several times, but before I had this channel, I had another channel called Those Hairy Gamers. In fact, I started that channel with Matt. And later on in the life of those hairy gamers, Justin joined on. Now, the reason I don't record a lot with Matt anymore is because he's not really a tabletop gamer. No. But you are a massive fan of Star Wars. Yeah, a little bit. Yeah, (laughs) pretty much. A little bit. In fact, you are arguably the biggest fan of Star Wars I know. Easily easily bigger than me. Easily bigger than me. Um, Well, I'm one of those Star Wars fans who likes the TV shows. I've seen the Ewok uh, Caravan of Courage. Oh, yes. Which is amazing. It's terrible. A fine film. (laughs) Fine film. Um, I've read a ton of the extended universe stuff. In fact, on my phone right now, uh, thanks to Audible, are 152 Star Wars extended universe audiobooks, which I'm getting my way through. And you don't work for Audible? Just making sure of this? No, (laughs) no. Okay. Audible, send me money. (laughs) Absolutely. Uh, Yeah, you've liked Star Wars ever since I've known you. I... I admittedly was not so much into Star Wars before The Force Awakens. I loved it as a kid. Yeah, everyone and, did. Yeah. And during the prequels, I kind of was like, you, know, well, you were well, like, oh my god, that Jar Jar guy is so sexy. And that, that's the one. That's the one. Uh, after episode two, I was I was kind of ambivalent. I ended up seeing episode three like on DVD years later. Um, but when The Force Awakens rolled round, I was right back into it. I don't think you ever stopped being a massive no. Star Wars fan that entire time. No, I remember the first time I saw Star Wars when I was a kid. And I, I, I vividly remember this. I would have been about... Seven or eight, mm. and it was uh, a New Hope was on TV, and I watched that with my dad, and I stayed up late, and they they had the two films, they had that and then Empire, and it, I did I, I was so young I didn't understand the two films. That's a good night. It, it was That's a, a very good night. And, and it finished like one in the morning, and for you know seven year old Matt, no way in hell. But it was a school night as well, and my dad was like, no, nah, no, nah, you know, mum go to bed. Uh, Matt has to see this, so I saw it. I finished watching Empire, and I'm like, okay, they've they've just. Everything's gone wrong. Han's gone. What's going on here? That can't be it. I didn't understand that there were two films. I didn't understand there was a third film. I thought there was one. That was Star Wars. And I was freaking out so much. The next day, my dad came home with a VHS copy of uh, Return of the Jedi. I was like, okay, here you go. Watch the rest now. And I still have that VHS copy. I was just thinking, you're every person that watched the first Lord of the Rings film without realizing it was a trilogy. (laughs) Which is like every other person I talked to about it. (laughs) So yes, Matt, massive Star Wars fan. So I have you here. To review The Last Jedi with oh, That's me. a bad idea. Yeah, let's go. Let's go for it. <laughs> now, we've made a whole heap of dot points, and we're just going to go through them one by one. Um, this video is not going to be ultra edited like most of the other videos I do, because I anticipate this is going to be a massive recording. But that's okay. Yeah. That's okay. I, I'm trying to do more conversational things. Um, in the lead up towards Christmas, we're having longer videos, a bit more freeform. Just trying to shake things up a bit. And I think this is another video that's the perfect excuse to try that format. So basically, let's just work our way through all of these dot points. And the first thing I want to talk about is addressing fan concerns. Because this is easily the most divisive movie I have ever witnessed I mean, in terms at, of fan reaction. At time of recording, uh, you can go on Rotten Tomatoes and it's uh, as a critic score, it's super high. And as an audience score, it's, it's lower than Phantom Menace. I actually saw this this morning. I, it was around 53%. Well, it was 57 when I saw it yesterday. Yeah, but the critic score was about 93, yeah. which is... Which is the opposite of pretty much... Uh, which is the opposite of um, the last one. Force Awakens. Oh, really? Yeah, Force Awakens had a low critic score, but audience score loved it. Okay, I, I can I can imagine that. Um, now, I have my own thoughts as to why that is. What? Why do you think that is, Matt? Well, I had a chat the other night with some friends of mine. Um, uh, we, were, we were talking about, oh yeah, have you seen the new, new film? Yeah, yeah, I saw the new film, it's great. And one of my friends, uh, he really didn't like it. And I was saying, dude, why don't why don't you like it? And he said, well, it's, it's too different. And I said, okay, did you like Force Awakens? And he goes, no, because it was the same as, as A New Hope. I said, okay, so you didn't like it when it was copying an old Star Wars film. You didn't like it when it was new. Um, why didn't you like it? And there was a couple of things, and he, he was, you know, we'll get into them, but there were a few things that he didn't understand in the film. And I said, well, have you seen the previous films? And he said, yeah. I said, well, they, that's what they're from. And he goes, well, but I need i need that explained to me. I said, well, they're not going to spoon, spoon feed you. That's a, a film, you're an adult, you should figure this out. And he's like, no, that's where I go to see a Star Wars film. I need to be spoon-fed these things. I just want to turn off and understand. But and that they've never great... spoon-fed. No. 
I mean, I'm, I'm not having a go at this friend of yours. I mean, no oh, one... By all means, go ahead. <laughs> it's all right. <laughs> I mean, it's a, it's a matter of taste, and this is what I boil everything down to. A lot of people don't like this film, and... In many cases, I actually agree with a lot of the complaints I've heard. Yeah, you can see where they're coming from. Oh, absolutely. But uh, in many cases, it's a matter of taste. And and this is art. At the end of the day, art is subjective. Being being spoon-fed stuff, like, I watch a film like Empire, like, maybe Jedi was a bit more obvious, but I look at films like A New Hope and Empire, they certainly didn't spoon-feed the audience. No. You know, those films were great because they were focusing in on a few core characters experiencing these large events happening in a big universe. Um, and that's really interesting. And and uh, I guess that brings me on to a point of that wasn't the case in this film. No. This was a big, big story arc. with is, a lot of, It is the longest Star Wars film. It is. Um, but the core events, um, what was happening with the characters was big news. Mm. The characters were witnessing the these big serious things that were affecting the resistance and the first order. Um, you know, they were a part of it. They were a part of the core political structure of what was going on. They were a part of when things went really bad for either faction. Um, from that point of view, it's different. It's not Han, Luke, and Leia running around doing their own thing while the bigger picture is going on in the background. This is the bigger picture happening in the foreground while the core characters are part of it. Yes, which is really really cool. I'm um, just going back to my previous point talking about fan concerns, and I just want to reiterate that fact. Uh, we are projecting onto the internet a liking for The Last Jedi. I, you think? <laughs> I, I have no illusions about the fact that that's going to draw a bit of ire. Look, if you disagree, go ahead. You're allowed to. If you agree, great. We're in like-minded company. There are hundreds, thousands of people disagreeing with us on the internet. There are hundreds of thousands of people agreeing with us on the internet. That's going to happen. Absolutely. Um... But the point I'm trying to make is, you're not wrong. No, nobody's wrong. I mean... Except you, fans of Jar Jar Binks. Okay, of course, well, let, let, we, we can all agree to that. Yes. But the point I'm trying to make is, um, there are a lot of things to do with this movie that really challenge our perception of what a Star Wars film should be. And that's actually a really good thing in itself. It, those things individually may not be good, and we can argue that till the cows come home. But the fact that we have a new Star Wars movie that is not just following in the footsteps of A Force Awakens, which really, really heavily borrowed from A New Hope. There are certainly elements of this film which mirror what happened in The Empire Strikes Back, but it is not a clone of The Empire Strikes Back. No. Not by a long shot. Um, which I was so relieved about for a start. I mean, for instance, in, in, yeah. in, um, in Empire Strikes Back, there's a scene uh, with, with a big sort of white expanse and there's these sort of low ground hovering... Uh, things by the rebels, and they're taking down AT-AT walkers. Of course. And then in um, in the Last Jedi, there's a scene with a big white expanse and there's some low speed of things being piloted by the rebels, and they're taking down AT-AT. Oh wait. A minute. That's right. But we're not salty about it one little bit. No, we're not salty about it one little bit. <laughs> um, and yeah, that's just the first thing I wanted to talk about. The fact of the matter is, it's it is challenging our core understanding of what Star Wars films are. And at the end of the day, I still think it does in such a way that doesn't break what a Star Wars film is. I felt like it was a Star Wars it film. It expands the universe. Yeah, exactly. And that's the thing. It felt like a Star Wars film. And that was a. And then that was the thing that really struck me with The Force Awakens. Um, after a, and, and look, okay, one more thing I want to say is we're not fans of the prequels. Um, I know a lot of you guys listening will be. A, again, that's a, that's, that, a, the, the that's a discussion for another video. The prequels did bring a, a few things that worked. There are a few things that expand the universe and go, okay, cool, I get it. Overall, not great. Yeah, I, I felt like it was, it was a departure from what the original films were. And The Force Awakens, What I well, the first big th thing I thought when I watched The Force Awakens was, we have Star Wars films again. Yes. These are actually Star Wars films again. Um, and the same I'm thing, proud to be a Star Wars fan again. Yeah, exactly, cool. exactly. And then we moved on to Rogue One and now The Last Jedi. And it still feels like we have Star Wars films. It feels like a continuation of the original trilogy. Which is awesome. Yeah. Which is awesome. All Absolutely. Right. So... Our next point, we're going to go through the things that me and Matt liked. Yes. Why These are not things we disliked. They're things that you know we liked. Yes. 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 Just in case that was unclear. These yes. are things that we didn't dislike, but we did like. Correct. All right. Just, right. just making sure we all understand that. Why don't you start this off, Matt? Well, I... Well, start off with the start of the film. I loved, and, and for several reasons, I loved the entire start scene with Poe Dameron taking on the Dreadnought on his own. Yes. I love that. That, for that sentence reasons. alone is quite nice. Yes. <laughs> no, that was fantastic. I loved everything about it. Um, for one thing, just purely basic down here, 
Poe Dameron is a fantastic fighter pilot. I don't think we've seen a, a, a pilot like him in the films yet. I know we've seen Anakin Skywalker. He can fly. I was going to say, Luke Skywalker. maybe Vader. We, we've seen that, yeah. Maybe we, Vader, yeah. yeah. He gets knocked into by his buddy in, an, in a TIE fighter. That guy didn't even get shot. He just swerved You can't way. sense a, a dumb smuggler through the force, Matt. Oh, okay, fair enough. Done. <laughs> um, but the, the fact is, yeah, cool. Vader, yeah, he's a good pilot. Skywalker, great pilot. Wedge Gentilly's pretty good pilot. Pretty good pilot that we've seen in the films. I know in the Expanded Universe he's really good. The fact is, Dameron is not a Jedi. He doesn't have the Force. He's just a damn good pilot. Yeah. Yeah. He is just... He's a hell of a pilot. Yeah. It's, there's just there's no two ways yeah. about it. And he's doing things in the X-Wing that, like that, that weird handbrake turn. It's like, wow, okay, cool. That can be done. Yeah. That was really cool. It's called a talent roll, Matt. <sighs> <laughs> Matt doesn't play X-Wing. Um, but well, I like that. I like the, the yes. bit we were talking. Uh, I like the um, the bit where he's talking to Hux. That, yes. that was great. Putting Hux on hold. That we, was amazing. <laughs> that was incredible. Because it wasn't slapstick humor, but it was enough humor for you to go, oh, that's really cool. I like this character. He's We're winning on his side. Oh, he's doing it on purpose. That's clever. Absolutely. I really dig that. And I think the whole thing with Poe Dameron, and this is what I like about characters in general, um, there's always something about a character which is suspension of disbelief. Mm. It's what is that core thing that a character can do. For Han, it's getting out of trouble no matter what. He's got good luck. That's what he has. Yeah, for sure. Um, or, or just good street smarts in general. Yeah. Uh, Luke is, is, a, is a great Jedi. Um, Obi-Wan's very wise. Poe Dameron's core character is he's an amazing pilot. Yeah. That he, is what to, his character is. To his strengths and his detriment. Exactly right. He's, it's, he's cocky and all that kind of stuff. And we'll get more onto that later in this discussion because we actually have a, a whole section talking about um, the short forms of characters and that kind of stuff. But as a character piece for Poe Dameron, as a character piece for Leia, as a character piece for Hux, as a character piece for Snoke, as a story arc uh, beginning in uh, the, the whole aspect of, of Poe being so arrogant he actively wasted resistance members to destroy the Dread North. Yeah. Everything about that scene was on point. He didn't see the bigger picture. Absolutely. Um, he saw it as a battle and he didn't see it as the war. Absolutely. And i got to say, I'm the kind of person who, when I'm emotionally invested in a film and I, and I really love the story arc, I love the dialogue, and this is no exception by any means, mm. I, I really don't like it when it starts out with a long, gratuitous action scene. I changed my mind watching The Last yeah. Jedi. Well, that's the thing. One of my favorite yeah. films is from Dust Till Dawn. Um, the old uh, Quentin Tarantino written, uh, directed by Robert Rodriguez. It's a yes, fantastic that's film. the one with Tarantino and George Clooney. And well they, done. Yes, and they go and find zombies. Now that, yeah. uh, vampires. Vampires, of course, sorry. No, there's like a 10-minute <laughs> intro to that, and there's a cop talking to a guy in a liquor store. It's 10 minutes, and they're, just, they're both bored. They're both sort of, you know, just... It's Tarantino, sure, I'm sure it's fine. <laughs> and then... You find out the entire time the guy they've had guns trained on them the entire time, and then that just turns the entire scene on its head. So if you watch it in the second watching, it's great. The first time you watch it, it's just a boring dialogue scene, and then it amps up, and that's that's one of my favourite ways into a film because it suddenly gets you involved. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. I mean, I mean, this it, is not that. <laughs> an example of a film that I felt did this badly, and this is actually a film that I like, mm. Skyfall, James Bond. Correct. Uh, it had a very long motorbike chase slash. Chain, uh, train chase um, sequence with Bond and Money Penny, and it was interesting because it had a little um, story piece with Money Penny. Um, spoiler alert: shooting Bond. Um, yes, but overall, that was an uninteresting scene. Um, the whereas it, the, the Spectre scene was different at the start. Yeah, with, with the, when he's walking across the building. Watch that again, fans, and you'll see him stand on very, very interestingly placed air conditioning ducts. That mean he doesn't have to stretch his legs too much. They work perfectly as stairs. It's quite amusing when you watch it again. I think we're getting a bit off topic here. Yes. But the point here is this is a long gratuitous action scene. And I, well, sorry, not gratuitous because A, it was so utterly exciting. And I think one of the reasons it was so exciting is because we still had those core characters mm. um, beginning their arcs. It was about uh, Hux and Ky- uh, not Hux and Kyle, Ky- Hux and Poe. Yeah. Both of those characters getting a lot of limelight right at the start of the movie and actually beginning their, their story arcs yeah. in the film. And even to some extent later. Like that scene afterwards, like I remember thinking right afterwards, like, whoa, Poe, that was awesome, man. You just wasted all your bombers. And then it cut 
to Leia looking at the console of all the crossed out ships and I'm like it knows what I'm thinking (laughs) (laughs) and and well um, it goes from being you know guns blazing what an exciting film to Hey, there's ramifications with yes. this stuff that we're actually looking at. Yeah, you can't just do a whole bunch of stuff and, you know, you can't lose Blue Squadron. That's it. That's yeah. how it happened. Mm. It's great. Absolutely, absolutely. Speaking of ramifications, another scene I, I loved. I really love this. And just purely visually, and also because I think I've been thinking of it ever since I heard of hyperspace, is the hyperspace scene where um, uh, mm. Hondo turns the ship around and as a last resort, fires it directly into the enemy ship. Uh, it was jaw dropping. Uh, when, I, when I was in the film, I mean, let me set the scene for you. I was in, I was in the cinema, and you know the film's gone. It's all good. And then that scene happens. Everything goes black and white. The audience is quiet. There's no sound, and you just see these stark images and the the, the cracking across the screen. It was it was incredible, and just built up and built up and built up, and it was so quiet. I, I forgot I was breathing, and then to the rear right of me I just hear one dude go huh <laughs> yeah and yeah, it sure. just it was it was amazing but th- that it-, it was incredible I remember after we watched The Force Awakens um, there was a big conversation between people because while it was a good Star Wars film considered by most people anyway yeah, to be a good Star Wars film I enjoyed it a lot of the things people were saying is um, it hit a lot of the same points New Hope did but it didn't have the same significance as New Hope because it wasn't pushing anything visually like New Hope did. Mm. This is the first time in a very long time that a Star Wars film has shocked us with its visuals. Yeah. Um, but also also the ramifications of it. Like, you know, the visuals and also, oh, that's why they've always got to calculate the hyperspace. Because you could do that into a sun. You could do that into a, yes. a, an asteroid or anything. They've that's talked, incredible. They've talked about it before. Um, we've never uh, seen it. Han mentions it in um, A New Hope. Yep. They talk about it in um, Rebels as well. Because there's um, the narwhals, these um, space whales that keep destroying ships accidentally. Which they is... mention it in the current Extended Universe uh, novel, Tarkin. Oh, really? Uh, yeah, they do. Uh, Tarkin's got his own ship called the Carrion Spike, which uh, I think you actually see in the Clone Wars. Oh, um, okay. And it's, it's a very small ship, and it's very fast, and it has its own uh, hyperspace computer in it, like the Falcon, uh, because a lot of the, the ships at that era had their own hyperspace uh, navigation computer things, but they weren't very advanced, and they couldn't compute things, so they had to do to stop and then move around, where the Carrion Spike and the Falcon could move around things, which is why the Falcon's so fast. Oh, yes, because I remember a Clone Wars episode where they talk about having to do several jumps around a nebula Correct. to get to like a Clone Wars medical facility. That was a story arc in yeah. one of the shows. By the way, guys, if you haven't watched Clone Wars, it's fantastic. I know, watch it. I know you can sort of dismiss it like I did, where you go, oh, it's for kids. It's it doesn't genuine. matter. If you get past <laughs> it the animation matter. and just get into the characters and story, you forget about that and really get involved. It's a perfect blend between Toy Story and Star Wars. Yeah. And I love both those things, so I don't care. Rex <laughs> Pretty and much. Cody, love those guys. Um, what was I going to say before? We were talking about... Hyperspace. Yeah. Ramifications. It feels to me, and this is just how I want to end this point, um, it's almost like they went to the visual teams and they just went, okay, we've started writing this film, but we haven't got it all nut- nutted out yet. I want you guys to think of the coolest thing we can put up on the screen. And we will put it into this movie. <laughs> uh, and when they shot down the idea of just putting a giant skull at Johansson up, they went, okay, how about this? Okay, that, and that's fair enough. Yeah. That's what they arrived on. It makes yeah. perfect sense. And I have to say, like, when I first saw it as well, um, it, it did strike me as a little bit of a plot hole. It's like, wow, they can just do this? But at the same time, it's like, well, they needed to spend... You don't want to do this a lot. <laughs> yeah, they, it was the Resistance's biggest ship to take out the First Order's Biggest ship. Yeah. I don't think they want to do that very often. No, because they, you know, they could have done the Death Star, but the Death Star had a whole bunch of shields and all that sort of stuff. And again, you don't want to do that. No, because the Death Star was a giant orb. It's very, very structurally sound, I guess is the explanation for mm. that. But as we saw in Return of the Jedi, you can just trade off a single A-Wing for the Executor. So it's not like this is a new concept. No. Um, just done in a way more epic way. <laughs> uh, yeah, love that bit, love that bit. Okay, the next thing we want to talk about... Yoda. 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 Mmm. Okay, <laughs> I I love the fact they brought him back. I loved, loved the fact they brought him back as a puppet. Yes, me too. <sighs> I'm I'm particularly a big fan of puppet, as you know. You, you're, you're basically are one. Puppets, even. Um, you basically, <laughs> basically are one. one. Um, yes, I'm a giant geek. I, I love, um, if you guys are familiar with Jerry Anderson, like Thunderbirds, uh, Captain Scarlet, those old sci-fi shows done with puppets. Yep. 
Um, and I like puppets in general, but particularly with Yoda, um, one of the biggest shortcomings I felt with uh, Lucas redoing the old films and the prequels and that kind of stuff was taking the puppet Yoda out of episode one and putting a CG one in place. Yeah, he put it in there and then took it out. To, oh, well, to, to be fair, it was to match up with the other films, but still. Yeah, it was kind of weird. And my whole attitude was he actually looked better before he made him CG. Mm. I'm actually disappointed they didn't use a puppet Yoda in episode two and three. Yeah. It's not because puppets are infallibly perfect. I mean, there is a certain deadness to the way they move. Like, you see Yoda bobbing forward and, like, the whole face kind of shakes. Yeah, but... I get that. But if it's characterised right and you've got Frank Oz, you don't care. Yeah, that's the whole thing. At the end of the day, it is something that's physical, that's something that is in the camera. It's, it's in real CGI, space, just go, for okay, sure. Cool, it's a thing. And it, it almost gets to the stage where I wish Mars was a puppet in um, <laughs> The Force Awakens. Correct, yeah. However, I... I accept as to why she wasn't. I accept that the look they were going for suited CG. It was disappointing that she was literally the only CG thing in that film um, when it was so many, so much um, around practical effects. Mm. As, well, on that yeah. front, I, I really enjoyed seeing her again in this as a little cameo in, in The Last Jedi as a cameo because, I mean, a lot of people were saying, oh, no, it's stupid. Why is she there? Well, how did she survive the last thing? She's a resistance fighter. We can see her fighting. That, that, again, fills in the universe. I was like, hey, Maz, can, can we have some help? Look, I'm busy. I'm dealing with my own stuff. Yeah. I enjoyed that. Yeah, I gotta say, I thought there was a massive cliche. It's like, I'd like it's the hero talking on the intercom while in the middle of a fight. I'm like, yeah, that's... It's clear. I mean, it was good. It was a good character piece for Mars. That's it. She had a cop yeah. out as well in Force Awakens, where it was, where'd you get this lightsaber? Oh, that's a good story. Good question. A good for question. Another time. Now... I really hope the fact that she said that's a good question means it'll be answered. But anyway, let's not let's not get bogged down myself. We're talking about Yoda here. We're talking yes. about Yoda. Um, brilliant. I liked. I liked. And this, Utterly brilliant. This is a. This is quite a cool thing. Is oh well, yeah, he's brilliant. He, he matches in, and he's the last time we saw Yoda and Luke, it was a puppet. So it makes sense to go back to that. <laughs> You're still talking about the puppet. Let's talk that. about the actual the character. What was going on there? The character. Well, he was. Uh, well, one thing really was. We can see that, you know, when uh, in A New Hope, when, when Kenobi says to, to Vader, uh, if you strike me down, or in anger, if you strike me down, uh, I will come back more powerful than you can imagine. Mm. And we've, we're have yet to see that until Yoda. Where lightning. Where he can literally <laughs> shoot lightning from the sky. Now, that's the first time we've gone, hmm, force ghosts can actually impact the world around them. That's pretty cool. Well. In the main film. Yes and no. Yes and no. I'm not talking about EU stuff. I'm talking about the fact that Luke was going to destroy the hut regardless. He was. And my whole thing was, okay, Yoda didn't really affect anything. And look, Obi-Wan and Yoda, when they were Force Ghosts, they just guided Luke. They just sort of sat down in a swamp. And yeah. even so, even though Yoda did something physical in the real world, including just knocking Luke on the head with his cane, he didn't, he didn't do anything more than guide Luke. No. And that's... And really, at the end of the day, I think that's what Yoda's trying to do. Actually, while we're on the topic of Yoda, this is a good point I want to bring up. Because a lot of uh, people talk about Luke and why was he there for so long. Why didn't Yoda intervene sooner? And that's the whole... himself off from the Force. Uh, That too, um, I don't think that stops him from talking to Yoda. I think it ultimately boils down to this. Yoda did not convince Luke to act. Ray did. Yoda gave him a little bit more of a push when Ray did most of the work. Ray, uh, sorry, Yoda was just biding his time this entire time. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean by yeah, this? Yeah, sure. And this just harkens back to the whole idea that Force Ghosts are only guides. They need a real catalyst to actually make things happen. Okay. Y- Yoda was not going to convince Luke to do anything up until that point. And even so, you're right, if Luke closed himself off to the force maybe he couldn't see the ghost although but then again uh, did, Le- did Leia see the ghost at the end of Return of the Jedi I, mean, I don't know I don't know I don't think she did uh, yeah I don't know but she's force sensitive too she's walked over and saw her brother and he's just staring at these dudes and be like okay cool whatever it's like yes those are some very nice trees those, yeah exactly <laughs> okay come back to the party um, I know you get hit on the head and then that's stuck on this way a few thousand well, times speaking of being on that island for so long um Talk about talk about when when Ray went under it. What she found. Okay, out. okay. Underneath the island, the, the the bit where there's the hole in the island and there's the black creep coming out of the end. Because we've seen there's the tree of the Jedi, and then there has to be the balance to it, which is underneath. Yes. It. Now, um, a lot of people don't understand what this is, and I'm happy to explain this because um, it's legitimately one of my favourite parts of the films. 
uh, film, and a lot of people find this the most perplexing part of the film. What that was was a Dark Force Nexus. It was exactly the same thing that Luke came across on Dagobah, that that evil place that he goes into Mm. where he fights Vader, he chops off Vader's head, and Luke's face appears on Vader's head. And I I would actually wager that back in the day when people saw that, they went, huh? Yeah, well, (laughs) I I did. I remember seeing it the first time, and I was like, what was that? Me as a kid as well, I would have been like 11 when I saw it, and I had no idea what was going on there. And... What it is, it's a Dark Force Nexus. And basically, Dark Force Nexuses force you to relive your worst nightmare. It forces you to face... your your, fear, yeah. um, It it faces your innermost demons. Well, because remember, you know, the dark side, fear leads to anger, anger leads to to hate, hate leads to suffering. And because there is just so much dark energy there, it actually, it materializes it in front of you. Mm. Um, Luke's whole fear was he would become dark or he would... You know, he, he would, would become he would, Vader. He would fight so hard to destroy this thing, but actually become it, which mm. is actually twice as bad mm. as not doing anything at all. And the whole thing with Ray was finding understanding in the universe, uh, finding herself, finding her place in the universe, finding her, and finding her parents. And her whole thing was, and this relates back to um, the way it culminated, the way um, it ultimately was revealed that her parents are not significant. Um, it was the whole idea of Ray searching and searching and searching. And along the way, she only had herself. Yes. That's why there was all the mirror images. And finally, when she got there, she got to a mirror and it was herself in the mirror. Mm. It's, I mean, have you ever had that kind of nightmare where like you're running down the street and you can't run? You just feel so ineffectual. You're you're running in molasses or you're running on the spot or something like that. Yeah. Exactly. It's a living nightmare. It's Ray wanting something so bad, but every other step of the way... It just, she gets the same result over and over again. It is, it's crushing, but it is such a powerful character moment for Ray. Mm. Um, and she needs them. Absolutely. She was, she was at risk in the last film being uh, regarded as a Mary Sue. Just a, just sort of a convenient character to, oh yeah, cool, we'll just give her four spells. Oh, she can fight. And she was, she's got a mysterious past. She's just amazing for all reasons. And now she's getting these character arcs and I think she really deserves that. Absolutely. I, I completely agree. Um, and it was actually interesting um, because... The expectations was that she was someone significant, but there was nothing really in The Force Awakens to suggest that. I mean, I yeah, there's the whole thing how, like, she's, no, no, don't leave me, and the ship's flying away. It's like, who left her there kind of thing. But what you've got to appreciate is she's allowed to be significant unto herself. Yeah. And that's what the ultimately the message of that is meant to be. A lot of fans disagree with that. They say, no, no, this is Star Wars. It's about family. That's the significant thing that's going on here. But no. Well, again, in this Ray one... is just a... Uh, Ray is Ray. Ray is a character to, unto herself. She she don't need no family. Well, that's the other thing. It, it, it is family because, uh, you know, when, when at the end of Force Awakens, she gets a hug from Leia. Uh, Chewbacca gets nothing. I mean, whatever. He's, <laughs> he's probably crushed, but he gets nothing. <laughs> um, but but Ray, Ray gets a hug. Uh, Finn has no family either, and that's probably uh, the sort of reason they're, they're quite close. They're, okay. They are their own family. They're creating oh. their own family. I didn't think of that. That's yeah. that's really interesting. Because um, that's at the end of the day, they are rebellion, and you can fit the rebellion now on a small freighter. So that's they've all that's all they've got. That is their family. That's just it. And and this is just another thing that really challenged the fans. It really challenged uh, what Star Wars is at the core. And I got to say, um, you know, if, if we're honest ourselves, is being in the family really a core element of Star Wars? It was a big reveal in Empire Strikes Back, and I was, think that was a few movies ago now. But my whole thing is like. This is a departure from Empire Strikes Back. You know, people complain if if it was too similar, but we're pushing the boundaries by making it different. And one of the core cool things is actually actively having the exact opposite outcome, which I guess you could argue is actually being the same th- kind yeah. of thing. But you know, saying that no, no, Ray is significant because Ray is Ray, and Ray is Ray because Ray is Ray. She is what he is because she is what she is. If she wasn't what she was, she wouldn't be what she is. That's pretty much it. And, yeah. and Ray is allowed to be a significant character unto herself. And I actually quite like that message. 
I, I, you feel free to disagree. I'm still annoyed that we don't know where to mail letters to her because she's just Ray. There's no last name or anything. Can't look her up in the white pages. I'll get over that. <laughs> For those of you who don't know, the white pages is the phone directory in Australia. <laughs> um, <laughs> and I do like this as another aside. As an Australian, Ray is an amazingly um, sort of lower class bogany name. G'day, Ray. Yeah, Ray. How you going, mate? Um, <laughs> yeah. And I, I like that whole story. And And... I'm sorry, we were, we were talking about the Dark Force Nexus. And that, <laughs> I know we, we constantly do this. Well, okay. In, in, well, I'll decide from there. In uh, Timothy Zahn's amazing uh, Extended Universe uh, trilogy, the, the, uh, the, you know, the Hand of Thrawn trilogy and all that sort of stuff, um, which now is relegated to non canon in the Legends, that said, they are bringing a few things in, like Grand Admiral Thrawn. In that, they talk about the Dark Nexus on Dagobah. And they reckon, because uh, Luke finds an old ship remote. Uh, a call ship remote and it turns out that that uh, Dark Nexus was created when a rogue Sith or Dark Jedi ran to Dagobah to hide out and was killed by a Jedi and it's heavily heavily implied in that that it was Yoda who hunted him down and that's why Yoda ended up exiling himself to Dagobah so we could keep an eye on that Force Nexus. In that old canon obviously. That, yeah, yeah it doesn't exist anymore but that's that there is a lot of stuff out there on Dark Nexuses as they are. Absolutely, absolutely. Let's move on to the last point we want to bring up that we quite liked. And this is more me, actually. I really liked Rose. I got to like her at the end. She was annoying at the start, but then, now, as you pointed out, she, I, she grew, I grew to like her. Yeah, for sure. Um, just as a new, interesting character. Um, I mean, you could say the whole love story with her and Finn was a little bit forced, but it's it's like um, Natalie Portman in Thor. It's it's fantasy. They They really push that to the point where it's a bit unbelievable, and that's just what fantasy is. But just in terms of uh, Ro- uh, Rose's history, it really um, was a good character piece for the universe at large. It talks about the foot soldiers. Hmm. Rose is the foot soldiers of the Resistance. Yeah, she, no, she's not even a soldier. She's a goddamn tech. And Her uh, sister was a soldier, and she didn't make it that far. But to be fair, neither of those are more significant than the other. No. And I love the whole thing with the necklace, um, with Del Toro's character. What was his name, by the way? Uh, DJ. DJ. But the whole thing with DJ, how he wanted... Which I'll get onto in a minute. Yeah, we'll talk about that in a second. Um, he wanted the necklace as payment. And her and Finn's whole thing was like, no, you can't do that. Like, you, that's, that's too significant to her. Which, of course, is exactly what the audience is thinking in that moment. Mm. And she's like, no, hand it straight to him. Because getting the mission done was more important than any of her sentiment. Yes. And that was a really powerful moment that, to yeah. her. That, that to I me, that. that was the moment her character was defined. Mm-hmm. I loved it and I loved the character. Yes. Um, I it, got that part yeah. and, I, and then she annoyed me a bit more. And, <laughs> yeah, sure. And then when she was talking about how and, and why she hated uh, the scene on the very opulent casino world. And she hated it and we're like, why is she hating it? She explains, you know, she grew up in a poor you know, poor community where they were abused by people like this. That made me more sympathize with her again. I was going, okay, cool. I get this. I get her character development. I get why she does what she does. And I really get that. It's yeah, really cool. Even in the sequences we didn't love, there were important story points. Yeah, there was not, not, nothing in the film ever happened where I was like, oh, I hate all this. Just stop. There was always something going on, which was amazing. And there were absolutely points. And like you were talking about the CGI horse racing for a start, where you didn't enjoy that. No. But... As it, made, it had me it gave me a flashback to the prequels and not in a good way. Yeah, for sure. But but as a as a plot point, it made sense. Yes, I agree. As a way of culminating at that whole casino scene, yeah, I get it. I get it. And actually, let's start off with that because we're going to talk about what we disliked. The CGI horse racing. I I liked the slow pan through the the room, and it was all one shot over you know the boom through all the characters and that. Um, and I love that because that was, that was a reference to an old 1930s film, I believe. Uh, oh, really? Yeah, which which does pretty much the same shot. Um, Look at you all smart. Oh, hello. <laughs> uh, but that that was fantastic. And that was that was a cool way of having the universe built, uh, especially all those characters. And I liked the fact that, oh, yeah, cool. We've, we've generally seen people at the bottom and at the middle. You're the soldiers and we've seen the rebellion. Now we've seen people with the opulence and the rich that isn't, they're not people like Jabba the Hutt. They're, they're Bigger than that, they're, they're you know they've got platinum, they've got everything, and then they went outside, and suddenly it was like okay, cool, this big amazing room where there's these characters in costumes, and there's these you know uh, tables you can look at and touch, 
it's now, yep, cool, we've just got these big running things around the circle that has no weight to it, and it's all CGI. You've worked so hard in most of this film, and most of the new films, to just throw all that away, and that really took me out of the film. Yeah, and I feel like the casino sequence overall uh, had some good parts to it, but there were just a lot of CGI in it, which just took you out of it. And we're not haters of CGI, but in that case, it didn't need it. No, absolutely not. Um, and it, it, yeah, it just boils down to that key factor. I felt like... And like we, we we can disagree on this whole casino sequence thing, but I felt like the casino sequence as a concept was fantastic. But seeing like the the polished brass version of the scum world we've seen so much in Star Wars was fascinating. It yeah. was excellent for universe building, but it was a bit sloppy. It was. Let, let's be honest. Um, uh, the, the whole horse racing thing. I I get what you mean. That whole chase. It, that was that's the gratuitous action. That's what I was talking about before. Correct. The kind of thing I don't like. And I get that it was it was a plot mechanic to get them off that planet and that kind of stuff to force them to go with DJ and and to start that part of the story arc. Yeah. But overall, I felt like they could have been better. Great in concept, in execution. Yeah, whatever. Could have been a little bit more polished. Yeah. I st- I still liked what was going on with the characters, Finn and Rose, yeah. both very good in that scene. Even BB-8. Um, I, I know you don't like it. I, I like the little alien putting coins into BB-8. Yeah, that was a bit annoying to me. It, it annoyed you. I actually that tickled me a little bit. I don't know why. And then him spitting out all the coins of the guards. That was amusing because that, then that made the first bit worth it. Yes, it was the payoff for that joke um, and that whole thing. But for sure. Okay, let's go on to the next thing that we disliked. And I, I think just in terms, uh, not as a plot point, but as a plot device, this is kind of... Strange. Yes. Uh, Leia suddenly flying through space. Now this, I, I've heard a lot of people saying it's good, a lot of people saying it's bad. I'll start off with my, what my immediate thought was when I saw it, when it was, you know, right before the, she got sucked into the vacuum of space, and we're looking at Leia in the face, and I I saw that and went, oh god, no, this is, this is, because as we know, the, the, the great late Carrie Fisher has mm-hmm. passed away. Um and we weren't sure how she's going to be in the next film. And yeah. I sort of had a minor heart attack in the film going, no, you can't kill Leia by throwing her out into space. You cannot do that. I was actually fine with that. But it was so early in the film. Uh, I've Yeah. yeah but that, that wasn't was the what point. my worry was. I'm like, oh, you're not going to do that. And then just have all that happen. But it was when it got the close up on her face. I was like, hello, you're not going to kill her and then show us her corpse floating through space. No. That's a bit much. Yeah. Um, and then she pulled a... I've heard th- this being compared to Mary Poppins or Superman. I'm Mary Poppins, y'all. <laughs> I'm here. <laughs> Yondo. No, she wasn't quite the same uh, thing as Yondo. No. But the whole thing of her using the Force and flying through space, it was a little bit pushing the suspension of disbelief. It was. I mean, it was, it was arguable. Like, you can go, okay, cool, she's Force-sensitive, she's in space, and now on, on the cusp of her dying, the Force acts through her, and gives her these, you know, the latent force abilities she's always had to pull her through space. And that kind of works. And this is what I'm talking about. As a plot point, that's fine. Just in practice, it looked a bit cheesy. That's my whole thing. I agree, yes. As, look, let's, let's break down that whole sequence as a plot. Kylo was about to shoot his mother. Kylo did not shoot his mother, but indirectly through his actions, um, his buddies did. Yeah. Which is still kind of the same thing. Fair in enough, the yeah. Uh, and then Leia almost died... She became force sensitive and didn't die. Those are actually the key plot points. How it was executed looked kind of weird. <laughs> That's the biggest issue. Yeah, I mean, you you can you know you can take those plot points and apply it in a way that's more satisfactory and fine. But that that's the whole thing. Um, what well, it, it's it it's the it's the what versus the how. The what is fine. The how's a bit iffy. And that's the thing. It it looked it was very cool. It was like, oh yeah, cool, she's flying. And it was also, ah, oh, it's a little painful to watch, a bit cringy. And then she gets to the window and they catch her. Um, but uh, all in all, I think uh, a lot of the argument with the old Star Wars, and, and this is why some things are a bit out of place, and, and a lot of the older times they're able to say that Star Wars films weren't, uh, the canon was a bit funny before Disney sort of straightened it all out. A lot of it was said is because uh, George Lucas was a big fan of Kurosawa films, they were always told by you know, war and stuff, told by two characters who sort of wandered into the war. And, it's, and that's why a few things are a bit fantastical, because they're told by these two characters. Originally, Lucas's idea, arguably, was to let R2 and 3PO tell the stories of everything. And that's why a couple of things could, could get a bit stretched. Oh, okay. Which is why on en- on Endor, when uh, he's talking to the Ewoks and he's showing uh, uh, Toronto, gosh, 
and he's talking about the ATATs and he's doing all this sort of stuff. He's telling this story, and that's that's an arguable way of doing it. And, and Kurosawa did do that with his films, and you can see that influence. Yeah. So you can kind of see that. That said, bit weird. Yeah. Much. <laughs> um, yeah. I wish C three PO used sound effects more often. Yes. <laughs> Just like, on that note. Okay. Um, next film, C three PO uh, has to be played by Michael Winslow from Police Academy. That's the one. Done. That's the one. Um, so yes, that whole sequence, a bit weird. Well, in that sequence, uh, I was a little annoyed that. Akbar just gone. Yeah. Just oh yeah, everyone died, including Akbar. But Leia's okay. Wait, hold on. Yeah. All, all, all mate, Akbar's gone. All, all the fans in the cinema went suddenly silent. <laughs> um, now I have a to. A million voices crying out. I have to ask. Suddenly silenced. I'm sure you remember this, and because I don't. Yes. Did he have to die recently? A few of them have died recently. Yeah, because there was Boba Fett and all that kind of stuff. But the guy that played Akbar was like 90. In the Force Awakens, and it was the same person. Uh, okay. Um, so, but he did say something in this film. So, it could have been a sound like I don't. Or it know. could have been an old, um, old clip from him. I mean, they've done that before in in Rogue One. They got bits from Cutting Room Four of uh, Red Red Five and Red, no, it Red was, Leader. It was definitely the new suit, though. Yeah, no, but they could have got the sound effects. Oh, so I see. Could, I see what you old mean. Voice clippings and put it across. I see, but it's usually more obvious than that. But in any case... Um, I didn't notice it in Rogue One. It doesn't bother me that Akbar died, but it felt like it felt like name-dropping him was doing the fans a service. It could have been service. any other Mon Cal. Uh, it, it, yeah, it, name-dropping it was doing the fans a service, but at the same time, it wasn't doing the character a service because he right. was significant. Yes. I mean, so, he's known as... It's a trap, but... The- He's more than that. We love the guy. Pretty much. He was named after a menu that George Lucas found when he was having food. Really? Yeah. I didn't know yeah, that. He was like, oh, I'm on calamari. That's a good idea. <laughs> they just took the S and the a- N off the start of it. Was it was like uh, Robot Chicken. Seth Green was because he's a Chinese restaurant near him. Had Robot Chicken on the menu because it was mis- mistranslated. Oh. Yeah. oh, yes. Yes, I did know that one. Um, and another thing, a poor handling of a character I want to talk about is Phasma. Yes. Um... I just found this very unsatisfying. Well, that's the thing. She was built up a lot in Force Awakens. She even got her own spin-off novel. And at the point, yeah. you know, like I said, there's a whole bunch of extended universe novels. There's a few, like a handful, I think five or six now, of the new uh, in the new canon um, that are officially done. There's Tarkin, there's Leia, Princess of Alderaan, there's uh, a Vader and, um, and Palpatine one, there's a Phasma one, and the, she has her own novel. And there's the Marvel comics as well. Yes. I think there was talk about a phasma comic i'm not gonna talk about things i don't know no um, but in, she has her own novel and she builds upon the character and, and Gwendolyn christie as, as fans of game of thrones know she's a good actress and she's well known mm. she was in the first one and we we're assured oh yeah cool she'll she'll be in the next one a lot more she was in it for a scene she was in it less than force awakens yeah and I she's an like interesting character they could have done so much more like in the force awakens where Finn was all up in her space going, hey, Phasma, hey, hey. It's like, ooh, ooh, there's a lot of, there's a lot of stuff going on yeah. here. Let's have some of that revealed. I will say I liked how there was an explanation for her wearing silver armor. Mm. It was blaster proof. Mm-hmm. Um, and obviously they couldn't afford to put that on every soldier. That's fine. Accepted. Tick. Well done. That, I did like that. Um, but, yeah, um, I, I love the fight between her, her and Finn. And that was a very good juxtaposition because, yes. again, Finn... Finn, as we know, has turned away from the Empire. He, he was literally just a number. And he became a, a rebel hero. And he's done a lot with his life. And originally he saw Phasma with fear. That's what he saw in the start of Force Awakens. And now he's come to war. He ran towards her in a fight. And mm. she's she's where she was. And it's it's kind of sad. It's like when you when you go back to a high school reunion and there was that guy who was really cool in high school because he, he would smoke behind the school and he had he had his bro- uh, big brother's car. And you meet him again. That was you, years. wasn't it? Uh, God, no, I didn't have a car in high school. Um, <laughs> but the you meet up with him again 10 years later and he's the same guy. He's just as you remember. And you're like, uh, okay, this is, this is not fun. This is pathetic. Yes. And what you're saying there it was a good story moment for Finn. And maybe you can make the argument that keeping Phasma the same allowed Finn to shine. Yeah. I kind of understand that, but at the same time, I felt Phasma had too much potential. And that was disappointing. Well, so yeah, she's she's literally the new Boba Fett, where, uh, yeah, he's really cool. He's standing in, in a bar and flirting with the waitresses, but then gets hit in the back and jetpacks himself into a pit in the middle of a desert. Uh, don't worry, mate. I've always been more of a Star Wars man anyway. Okay. Um, <laughs> Anyway, let's move on. Let's move on. Let's go to the points that me and Matt disagree on. Yes. Because there's a couple of things going on here. 
We talked about the casino sequence before. Um, the, the, we're, we're both conflicted on this. We both. I, I, I like it as, as a universe expanding idea. I really loved the idea where we've, we've seen the rebels and we've seen people at the bottom, we've seen people in the middle. We've now seen people from the other walk of life where we've never had the chance to before. Um, where you've, you've got someone working on both sides. You see someone who's profiting from war. Like in real life, what, what is happening there? You've got weapons designers, you've got dealers. They're there, and that built upon the universe. I, I would like to see more of that. Absolutely. Um, but it, it's got to be done in a way which is a bit more palatable, which, which serves the story a bit better. Yeah. I liked what it was doing. I just felt the whole sequence overall was a bit meh. And this is something which I agree with a lot when it comes to people that dislike the film. The casino sequence is a big sticking point for a lot of people, mm. and a sticking point for me. I just don't think it hurt the film overall. No. Um, that's my whole thing. It um, could have been polished a little better, but... Yeah, overall it's, B plus. Yeah, um, but something like we actually disagree on because we didn't disagree on that. Um, Ito Toro's character. Yes, um, I, DJ. Yeah, DJ. Now, why don't you go first? I didn't like him. <laughs> I didn't like him. I felt like there was nothing to this character which we hadn't seen in Star Wars before. Better. We have seen other characters be like this. Like Hondo Inaka is a better DJ in, in right down to the core. He's referring to someone in the Clone Wars. Uh, Clone Wars and Rebels. Mm. And he um, he's a pirate that deals with both the Empire and the Rebels. And he is one of the funnest characters in the whole canon. And he's voiced yeah, I, by I the always, voice of Winnie the Pooh. <laughs> <laughs> I always sit up whenever he's on, on TV. I'll just be like, okay, I want to see My friends! Scene. Yeah, he's <laughs> yeah, so cool. He's, he's got that, that quintessential... <laughs> is this a trap? Well, yeah, of course. But I'm telling you about it, so it's okay. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> It's like, why you want to start a story? Oh, they pay well. Yeah. <laughs> kind of thing. And it's actually fun. DJ, I felt like, uh, it was it was very clumsy how he was sort of introduced. And like, I kind of felt like at the start, meeting him in the jail, oh, it's like a chance meeting. This guy might just be the answer to everything. And he just turns out to be another scum. Which I loved. I loved that. You did? Yeah, yeah, because too often there's that serendipitous where we're going, oh, they've met him in the jail cell? That's cool. They were going for that really suave guy and they, they didn't get him. They got this scummy guy, but that's okay because that's a rebel. No, it's not always going to work out that way. And I love that. I, and as I was saying before, I love the other side of things. Yes, we've seen other characters like this, and I'd argue Han Solo. Because remember at the end of New Hope, he was like, nope, screw you all, I'm taking my money, I'm leaving. And he had a change of heart and he came back and saved Luke. DJ is the opposite of that, where he's like, you know what, screw you. They paid better. I'm leaving. It's a very interesting point. Um, and, and I have to say that is challenging my views here. <laughs> and another couple of little cool bits. Uh, um, well, Benicio Del Toro is a fantastic actor. I've heard a lot of people hate his stutter. Again, I like that because, well, first off, I'm a big, as, as you are, you are more so, a big James Bond fan. And you've got yes. characterizations like that with flaws or anything like that tend to be the villains. And and um, DJ did give off a couple little hints. A couple little hints. and Such as, his name is DJ. The little box that he opens up and, and he's got on his uh, on his hat, supposedly in uh, Algarian or whatever the hell the, the Star Wars language is written in, says, don't join. <laughs> really? Yes. That's brilliant. Yeah. So okay. it's little hints like that where you're like, okay, I don't trust this guy. I guess why, so. Why am I trusting him? And when he's raiding his own ship, oh wait, this isn't your ship. <laughs> That was pretty cool. So it was like a lot of hints going, oh. I gotta say, that was the most interesting part of the character. And then he redeemed himself by giving the medallion back, quote unquote, but then he just didn't. Uh, I don't know. It just felt sloppy to me. Well, he took it because he knew what the steel was. Uh, but and, and that's kind of the reason I like him, because he's an interesting character. He's not fighting for the rebels. He's not for the Imperials. He's going for the highest bidder. There are going to be people like that in a war. I guess so. He fills, he fills the universe. I just felt like it could have been done better. Actually, you were talking before about James Bond. Do you remember his character in a James Bond movie? Oh, God. Yes, that no? one. Uh, License to Kill. Yeah. He, he, uh, he disappears at the start of the first act and then reappears at the end of the movie. How old is Benicio Del Toro? Uh, very old. Has oh. someone checked on him recently? <laughs> oh, he was like he was like 20 when that okay, movie came yeah. out. So he's, yeah. He's just a wee baby. But he's a, he's a good character. Oh, sorry, character. He's a good actor. But, but well, the point of being that is, is like, uh, he, uh, that character had a lot more gravitas in that movie. But in Star Wars, uh, I don't know. I felt like it could have been done better. Like, I, uh, this is what I was saying about before about Rose, um, with, um, when we're talking about the things that we liked. I, I felt like that character was just so well done. 
sure some of the plot points um, that really brought her, her character, like the casino sequence, were a bit sloppy, but her as a character was fantastic. Mm. I didn't quite feel that with DJ. And that's just what I want to bring out. Fair I, enough. Actually, we just talked about things we like. I just want to say, um, just jumping back there for a moment, in The Force Awakens, we barely saw Poe. We saw Poe in this movie. Oh, we saw yes. Poe. That character... He was literally a hotshot pilot to his detriment. That was great. Absolutely. And uh, again, we're going to talk about this more often, but we that's something I really wanted in this movie. Yes. I really wanted more Poe. And we got it. And yes. I was so happy about it. But, um, yeah, but the things we just, we just like. Nick, Nick, Nick ships uh, Poe and Finn, by the way. So, yeah, yeah, oh, absolutely. Um, what? <laughs> um, and, and another thing I wanted to see more since The Force Awakens was more Chewy. And we didn't really see more Chewy, unfortunately. We saw, we saw a bit of Chewy. Yeah, there was a bit of Chewy. He, he was going to eat something a bit Chewy. <laughs> that <laughs> that yeah, was terrible. That I apologize me, immediately. Yeah, you should feel bad. Go sit in the corner. Absolutely. Um, let's move on to some more points. And these were controversial and to, these, to the fans at large to the fans at large and these are not things that we agree uh, or disagree on uh, yeah for sure and let's talk about the first thing you, you start this off Matt well the fact that in the first film we saw this big amazing hologram which not was did we not know whether that was a hologram at the time of uh, of Snoke and we're like oh this guy's really interesting he's humanoid he's, he's, he's got giant hands so he's not human he's got a different shaped head I want to know who he is and it's played by you know the great Andy Serkis so he's a CGI character and that's unusual. So we're watching him in this, and he looks photorealistic. His eyes look good. He doesn't have that uncanny valley. He looks... Oh, that CG was fantastic. He looks very good, actually. He looks better yeah. than CG Tarkin. He looks better than Robo Tarkin. <laughs> Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Um, and he, he was a very interesting character, and he built up, and he's built up. And he's referenced in uh, Battlefront 2, in the video game. Okay. Uh, he's a very important character that Palpatine knew about him, and he wants to go seek out this Force user. He's not a Sith... He's, but he's a, more of a dark Jedi. He's more of a dark force user who uses it to his exploits. Okay. He's a very, very interesting character. Built up, built up, built up. And no. And I think one of the reasons this is so controversial is partially because of the mirror images between him and Palpatine. Obviously, he is... There is going to be a comparison, yeah. Exactly right. And Palpatine lives to the very end of Return of the Jedi. He, he survives the three something, film arc. Something, dark side. That one. That one exactly. Snoke, um... Uh, he, he gets he's, his throne room scene. He's got even the Red Guards, like Palpatine. is a big fan. A big fan of... <laughs> big fan <laughs> of Palpatine. Big fan of old Sheev. And, uh, I don't know. And actually, I, I have to agree to some extent. I didn't like how Snoke... We didn't really learn where he came from. And it made sense with Palpatine. We had, in the prequels, a fantastic Palpatine arc. We had... Yeah, I, I really... He was one of the best parts of the prequels. Absolutely. And that, that whole thing, it... it he had gravitas. We just have Snoke in these films, and arguably we just had Palpatine in the old ones. But to just introduce him as is, is like, I'm just here. It's like, well, where did you come from? We want to know more about this. And he was an interesting character because he he has power. He has power. He lifts up Rey. He's, he's able to hold her. I love how he just, he just smacks the ground and the lightning comes out of it and just saps Kylo. That was really cool. Like, so he has he was power. Force so he lightning was, without even trying. So he was yeah. fearful. Like, oh, no, he, we were fearful of him. He was amazing. Um, but that said, the way his death happened, I gotta say, when that happened, I, I was flashed back to my childhood where I was watching, you know, uh, Jedi for like the fiftieth time ever, uh, age eight. Only fifty? I, oh, I'm on about four hundred at this point. Oh, fair enough. Fair enough. Um, but I was watching as a kid, and I was just thinking, well, look, if Luke puts out his hand to grab the lightsaber and then Vader stops him, yeah, cool, very cool. Why didn't Luke just turn the lightsaber and turn it on? And I was watching that as a kid. I'm like, just and, and you know what? Wow. Yeah, and I was watching. <laughs> okay. I'm like, so I was thinking as a kid. I'm like, maybe, maybe there's a problem with that. Maybe you look, have to touch a lightsaber. Maybe you can't do that. Look, Matt, it's very important that he both pull the lightsaber towards himself and do a massive wind back. All of that was very important. I don't know why, but ask George. Yes, <laughs> old mate George. Old mate George. I'll call him. That's the one. And. I wish there was a bit more to Snoke. I mean, arguably there could be more afterwards, but I don't think. Snoke is meant to be the important one. And I think this is the explanation here, is he's not the important one. Kylo is. Mm. Kylo is now the supreme leader of the First Order. Which is a bit more unpredictable than Snoke was. Um, which I actually really like. I'm excited about I that. Like, playing off Hux, throwing him against the wall. I love how the the supreme leader and the general actively want to kill each other yeah. and their children L that is actually way more interesting than just having a palpatine clone. long live the supreme leader absolutely oh. um 
Yeah, and Hux was like, do something, and he just throws him against the side of the shuttle. Without even thinking, it was amazing. Oh, it was amazing. And, I, and Oh, that scene. That scene where Hux finds Kylo knocked out, and he reaches for his blaster. And then Kylo stirs, and he and he puts his hand back. Yes. And it's like, whoa. Yeah, Hux. If that's not foreshadowing for episode nine, I don't know what is. Well, that's the... Um, I, I recently read the, uh, the current... Expanded Universe novel Tarkin. Yes, and, the Tarkin Doctrine. Yes, yes, well, no, I've the, heard about this. But Tarkin was great because that that whole novel is is it's his his life, um, and there's a great bit in it where him and Vader, uh, just the two of them, for like a month in a spaceship, and it's very very interesting because it builds upon their relationship that you see in A New Hope. And watching it again as a kid, you're going, "Damn it, Vader is is Tarkin's bitch. He he's just like you know, yeah yeah he is his bitch," and. It, it's sort of bu- there's, there's some sort of heated rivalry there, and it's bubbling in service. Hux and and Kylo is that to the next step? They are, you know, sh- just short of trading blows with each other, and in some cases are. Yeah, they're they're both second in command to yeah. Snoke. So what happens when Snoke dies? This is what happens yes. when Snoke dies, and it's significant. And so, as a controversial point, I understand that Snoke's death sucks. From that point of view, but for but what think it means... about what it could do. But what it does to the story at large, I love. Yes. I love. Um, let's talk about Ray's parents. And, yes. and we, we touched upon this before, but the whole idea that Ray has... Their, his her parents aren't significant. We didn't even see them. No name drop or anything. Yeah. I, I love that. Me too. I love that because... And the thing is, we were expecting... Oh, she's a Kenobi she could be a Palpatine. She could yes. be Palpatine's granddaughter. She could be a clone. She could be a Skywalker. Could a, be anything. A clone. Yeah. She, she's not Maori. But anyway, go on. <laughs> <laughs> she could be a clone. She could be anything. Um, there was there was a leak with uh, those, uh, what are they called? The Disney, the toys that you plug into your PlayStation. Um, there was a leak on that where someone had recorded dialogue of Kylo. Ta- if you put the two of them in the game, Kylo would taunt Rey's character and say, come on, cousin, strike me down. And then they pulled that from the game. They pulled that line of dialogue from the game. So everyone was like, ooh, ooh, it's, it's, a, it's a cousin, it's a cousin. And, and Mark Hamill, you know, the, the insane troll that he is, would post on Twitter, oh, I love her like a daughter. And he'd do, Wink! Yeah, he'd do things like that. Every time, yeah. Um, and, and the, the thing knowing is, full well. Yeah, knowing, knowing full absolutely. well. <laughs> and, and, you know, when, when they just dismissed that, that was, that was Empire, because we were going into it going, oh, Who's she gonna be? It's gonna be like Empire. That's the big. That's the big twist here. It's gonna be. Oh, it's gonna be one of them. And when they go, no, that was a big twist because everyone's like, oh, what? You can't do that. This is a Star Wars. <laughs> and that's the twist. That said, that said, Kylo could just be saying that to screw with her. Yeah. Um. We don't know yet. I don't think he is. I don't think he is either. But I think the statement that her parents are insignificant doesn't mean she's not significant for another reason. That said, though, again, yeah. now I think about it, yeah, as has been established in the uh, the Almighty prequels, um, <laughs> there is uh, there is precedent for midichlorians being passed on genetically. Oh, don't. <laughs> so, yeah, her parents may have been force sensitive. So really? they might have been important characters. They might not have been. So, but mi- for her to be so powerful, her parents. Probably Can you just were. clarify that point? Midichlorians force. Parentage genes, yes. Metachlorians. Metachlorians are something measurable in, in in Jedi's blood. We know this. And oh, there you're is talking a genetic about, component to it. You're talking you, about Anakin and Leia and Luke. Yes. Oh, okay. Yeah. There is a genetic component to it. Oh, that was pointless. That it was. was. I mean, we're not viewing episode one, but what a pointless scene. <laughs> now this is pod racing. This is pod racing. Everything is pod racing. Except um, the sand. I hate it. It's coarse and dry. It gets yeah, everywhere. Yeah. I mean, that whole thing with Ray. And and it was a real it's a real point of salt for a lot of fans, um, but I think it mm, just boils, <laughs> yeah, it just boils down to people putting their expectations of the film and not living up to that, and that just that just makes people think that it's bad, and it's not necessarily. It's going bad. back to the spoon feeding. It's not what the audience expected, so you're mad. You spent two years trying to come up with theories, and because it didn't match your theories, you're pissed off. That's okay. You're allowed to be, but the fact is, that's what the film is. And it's great. Now who's salty? <laughs> Damn you all. Uh, no, you no. blew it up. You blew it up. And the last controversial point we want to talk about is Luke's death. Yes. Um, I, I told you this would be spoilery. Don't say I didn't warn you. <laughs> <laughs> I said, oh no, Luke died. Uh, yeah, Luke totally died. 
No, he, um, he assimilated himself into the Force. He became one with the Force. He died. <laughs> he became one with the Force. And his cloak went away, which made me think, Luke's Force ghost is naked. Uh, but Obi-Wan's Force ghost is naked. And he's quite naked. Naked. <laughs> He's naked under his robe. You just wanted to sell yellow. I just naked want to imagine ma- yeah. Mark Hamill naked. Mark, call me. Um, <laughs> we're going more and more insane as this review goes on. The recording's currently at one hour, and you're already imagining Mark Hamill naked. I'm I mean, always imagining Mark Hamill naked. Well, that's fair enough then. Um, but the whole thing was Luke's death. Um, it was a controversial point, and we're going to talk about Luke more as this goes on, but well, here's it lot- was important. What a lot of people are saying to me is... Uh, they're going, oh, well, how did he die? He didn't get stabbed with a lightsaber, he didn't do any of this. Cool, neither did Yoda. The fact is, Luke, mm. look, he was he was projecting... No, did Obi-Wan. He, yeah, no, there we go. Yeah. He was projecting... <laughs> uh, he got stabbed with a lightsaber. Yeah, Nobody but he still did the disappearing yeah, thing. Yeah, but he still got stabbed with a lightsaber. Okay, fair enough. Um, sorry, sorry. <laughs> the fact is, Luke has spent so many years without the Force. I mean, yeah, he's very powerful. He's, you know, Luke Skywalker. He's the legend. Um, <laughs> the legend. You, go, you got the voice and everything. Yeah. That was perfect. <laughs> um, he he exerted himself. He you know astral projected himself across a galaxy, and even had you know was able to physically touch Leia and hand yeah. her dice. Yeah, okay? that, that was actually so, incredible. So that was a ton of power. How how else does the legend go out? He does something completely unprecedented. Yeah, I loved that so much. And then when he did go out, he saw the twin suns. Which was the twin sons, for those of you who don't remember from A New Hope, that was the beginning of him being Luke Skywalker. The twin sons on Tatooine. It's actually emotional to think about that. And I, I, I'm getting goosebumps thinking of that scene. I I welled up when he said goodbye to Leia. Yeah. Not because Luke said goodbye to Leia, because that was Mark saying goodbye to Carrie. Yes. That was actually... Like, I'm I welling up think thinking that. about it right now. Yeah. That was actually really hard to watch. We're a bunch of dorks, but yes. Um, yeah. Um, and that whole thing, like him seeing the twin sons... It was the it was the beginning and end of Luke Skywalker, not as a name, but as a person. It was his journey at the start and the end. It was the twin sons, possibly on a planet that doesn't have twin sons. It, you know, it was about. What, I didn't think about that. Yeah, that planet may not have had the twin sons. His it was force a, power brought a second son <laughs> into the solar system. Oh, so many creatures died. Yes, everything went wrong. <laughs> That's why he evaporated. <laughs> Everything went wrong. <laughs> That's the one. Oh, but it was so poignant. It was so poignant. And we're going to talk more about Luke in depth uh, well, I, in a I bit. I really hope that, uh, you know, because we showed uh, Yoda's Force Ghost, I'm now hoping that we're going to have Luke as a Force Ghost, as a guide uh, to show I'm Ray. pretty... Co- no, 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 as a ghost trolling Kylo. Ray and, yeah, yeah God, God, yes. I'll see you soon, kid. Yes. I, I do not think that was a mistake. That I think would be good. Much I, like Mark Hamill haunting uh, Batman in uh, the Arkham Knight game. Absolutely. Um, but I genuinely think we have not seen the end of Mark Hamill in these I movies. I hope not. Well, actually, I read this interesting thing the other day. Yep. Supposedly, after Hamill had read the script, he went to, Ray, um, to Ryan Johnson and he said... I hate everything you've done with the character. I hate what you've done to Luke Skywalker. Uh, and I hate the, the character's progress. Now I've got that off my chest. I'll do my best to, to give you your vision. And he nailed it. Every second he was he, on the screen, he I was could incredible. Not, I didn't care who else was in the scene. I was just watching him. I mean, Mark Hamill has sort of become sort of infamous for being a, a, a an actor who can only play one character. The Joker. The Joker, he, you know, a few characters, whatever. <laughs> um, but he's in. But let's not deny the fact that he is an incredible actor. He is. A he very is good legit actor. an incredible actor. I, one of my favorite things, like I, I really, I genuinely love Mark Hamill as a person and an actor. Yeah, oh, me too. And a voice actor. Yeah. Um, he just crops up all the time. In uh, those of you who have seen the Kingsman film, he's in the Kingsman film. Oh, really? As, yeah. Now, have you seen the first Kingsman film? I, I gave up at 10 minutes. I didn't like okay, it. Okay, well done. Um, <laughs> so glad you're here. You're wrong. <laughs> okay. You're wrong. Um, now, in the comic book by Mark Miller, um, yeah. it's, they, they, there's a character who, who kidnaps celebrities. Okay, And the start of the film starts off with his kidnapped Mark Hamill, the actor. And he's holding him to ransom. And these guys, the spies come in and they, they save Mark Hamill, the actor. In the film, they change the plot. He's not kidnapping actors, but he's kidnapping climate change scientists. And then famous people. So the first scene is now no longer the actor Mark Hamill. It is a climate change scientist. Played by the actor Mark Hamill. <laughs> and it's just a nice little... This little 
I like that. Yeah. I like that. So it was climate under the credits it was climate change scientist in brackets as Mark Hamill. Yeah, yeah, that one of those things. But it was yeah, it was, it was amazing. I like that. I like that. But just getting back to the point of Luke's death, yeah, absolutely. Um, it was powerful. It look, was as, as a sticking it point, was shocking, yeah. Um, look, and it challenged us so much. And I think that what it boils down to. That's why some people don't like it. It was so challenging, and it is. I, I'm not going to dance around this. It is emotional watching a character oh, yeah. like Luke Skywalker die. Someone we've lived with. I mean, again, I've been watching this film since I was what six or seven. Yeah, and Luke Skywalker is a huge part of my. He life. is legit one of the best characters in it. Like, like for me, well, he's like, one of the biggest characters in pop culture history. Yep, yeah, for sure. And I think I felt the same way after the Force Awakens as well. Seeing what happened to Han. Spoiler alert. Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Let's go. Okay, yeah, it, we're doing a spoiler review of the last Jedi, but we can't spoil the Force Awakens. No, that's, we didn't warn people. Oh, oh, sorry, sorry about that. Yeah, yeah. Han dies. Um, <laughs> um, but Han. But the whole thing that happened with Han. Yeah. It, it was like. Yeah, that was, that it was like Dumbledore's death. Spoiler alert. <laughs> <laughs> but 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 it served the story so well, and it actually served his character. Yes. I love that Han died trying to bring a dark Jedi back to the light. Harrison Ford liked that Han died. Well, of course, he didn't want to do it anymore. <laughs> That's Harrison Ford. He's a grumpy old man. He's America's grandpa. Um, but both of these deaths, I just feel like, yeah, look, you can be... Like, don't mistake your sorrow for uh, thinking this is bad. It is gut-wrenching, but it is not bad in terms of filmmaking. It's gut-wrenching, but it's not sad. Anyway, let's move on to the next point. We're gonna we just got a few more dot points we're gonna talk about, and these were just aspects that again people have been talking about. But um, uh, the next thing I want to talk about is the humor in the film. Yes, this is a point that a lot of people either love or hate, and I, a lot of people really hate this. Yes. I mean, there's there's no two ways about this. And well, there are some people hated it, some people didn't. I, I I bring this back to it's a point of taste. You're not wrong for hating it, mm. but personally, we loved it. Yeah. Well, um, there's, there's funny bits yeah. in, in all the Star Wars films. Probably not as overt as this one. But yes. there are funny bits. Like, um, you know, boring conversation anyway. In A New Hope. Oh, I love Can that. Can someone get this walking carpet out of my way? You came in that thing. <laughs> uh, these these are, are funny moments that, that are in place and they work. And they're indicative of that time period. Yeah. And, and of the characters themselves. Yes. And that's what I want to bring the humour to in The Force Awakens. Um, it... Is indicative of the characters. Mm. Let, let's talk about arguably the funniest slash most spotlightiest joke in the entire film. Chewbacca eating a porg, or he was about to eat a porg, then the porg looks at him all sad, and yes. Chewbacca doesn't eat the porg. And then Chewbacca loves porgs. Yes. Um, and yeah, that's, that's the next time we see him. He's got a whole bunch of them. And, I, and, he, and, he, did beca- and he joins the porgs, and he becomes one with the porgs. I loved it. Not because it was an amazing joke, and it was an amazing joke. <laughs> that close-up of that porg looking at Chewbacca was... Made me want a porg. It made me want to eat a porg. <laughs> 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 I don't want to eat one. I want to um, cuddle one. Oh, that too. That too. I, I want both. I want it was, both. It was weird because it's a little bird with wings, but it's also like a cat nose. So, and yeah. a big ally. I so know. It's, it's like they pretty much went, okay, let's get the genetic blender here. What are really cute animals and put them all together? But what I love about the whole arc of, of, of that joke following on to him adopting Porgs, whatever, it, 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 it's shining a light on two really big things about Chewbacca's character. One, he will just eat anything he comes across because, hey, it's Chewbacca. We saw this in Return of the Jedi. Yes. And, of course, the first thing he does when he gets to Luke's island is like, I, I can't... I can't fish. I'm going to eat this chicken. <laughs> that's, you know, I mean, I've got, res- I've got you know, reserves and stuff on the Falcon, but screw it. There's a chicken here. Pretty much. And the first thing he does when he's about to do it is he becomes very, very sad and goes, oh, oh, but he's they're, a bit guilty, they're, yeah. they're adorable creatures. And this actually refers to Chewbacca's character in the extended universe. Yeah. He goes to Endor to live with the Ewoks, as that guy from South Park said. <laughs> you know, he, he, he actually loves creatures. Yeah. Um, but he also loves eating. And it's this genuine conflict within Chewbacca. He's like me. Like, beautifully illustrated by a very funny and poignant joke. Yeah. And I just love that. I just love what that was doing. Uh, before we go on, uh, audience, I'm going to close my window because there are cicadas outside. It's currently... Cicadas are one of the few things in Australia that we don't know. That they probably don't kill you. Hopefully they will get their way into Star Wars, that's for sure. Alright, cool. <sighs> and I'm back. How are you? I'm good, thank you. Excellent. Um, the other the other funny bits that I like, well again we've we've touched on it before, is the Poe talking to Hux over the intercom at the start. Oh my 
God, that now, was so funny. Those of you who have seen, uh, spoiler alert, uh, Thor, the new Thor film. Um, I have not, so be careful. Okay, of Thor Ragnarok. Well, I won't. Uh, there is a lot, a lot more funny. You'd love it. There's a lot more funny parts in that, uh, due in part to its director, who's one of the guys who worked on Five of the Concords. Yes. And uh, What We Do in the Shadows, which is an amazing indie film from New Zealand. Now, in the very first scene of that, there's a joke where the Thor is hanging from a, a chain and slowly rotating. Like, just... And it's very hard to explain. He's slowly rotating, and he's trying to talk to the villain, but he, then he, he faces the wrong way. He's like, wait, wait. I'm coming back. I'm coming back around. Wait a sec. Okay. okay so it was to- him, like, trying to do, like, a dramatic hero speech. While but, slowly rotating out of shot. But the... But the uh- <laughs> But the reality of the scene, yeah, yeah. that's brilliant. So it's it's like and, that. It's not overtly funny, but it's like yeah. sort of okay. This is stupid, and we all realize this is stupid. just as an aside. If if you can explain something funny in a movie, and it's funny just on the explanation, you know it's funny. Oh yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, there's there's that film itself is is full of funny parts. Is the funniest Marvel film, absolutely. But it's not slapstick, which and, is what a lot of this was like. So um, what well, wasn't? So so post part where he's talking on the intercom, that was funny. Was, I liked that. It was so funny. It was so funny. And that's actually... I'm so glad you brought up Thor and the Marvel Universe in general because um, a lot of what uh, Marvel were doing, uh, particularly as the, the franchise went on, they realized humor is a great uh, vehicle to capitalize on what these characters are. It, it's a great vehicle to sort of um, just break down the film, make it just a bit more palatable and fun. And I don't think it, this is, and this is again my opinion. A lot of you will disagree. I don't think humor has hurt the Marvel universe at all. Um, a lot of people like Ant Man was the first significantly funny end to end film, and some people didn't like that. But uh, when I was said it a good film, yeah, oh yeah. Well, <laughs> again, that that's subjective, and we're not here to talk about Ant Man. But I, I look at um, no, <laughs> sorry. I thought this was the Ant Man podcast. You lured me here under false pretenses. It's not a podcast; it's a YouTube video. Hello, oh, you lured me here under that as well. Oh no! But the point I'm trying to make is, Star Wars is a fantasy, and humor is not out of place in fantasy. No. Look, I, I get what people are talking about in terms of it took me out of the Star Wars film. It it made me feel like it wasn't Star Wars for a few seconds. I get that, but at the same time. I'm not there with you because of how well it worked with the core nature of the characters who were making the jokes. Yes. Let's 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 look at the juxtaposition of this episode one, and I did not like the humor in episode one, and neither did you. I no. know. Well, looks on your face. Are you, you thinking of the part where he put his uh, sorry, Jar Jar Binks put his head between the laser bits <laughs> and then looked at the camera and thumbs up <laughs> partially. But overall, what the the jokes in episode one were, a bunch of very serious Star Wars character doing very serious Star Warsy things, and then a clown walks in. Yes, <laughs> that wasn't yeah. what it was well, like. Well, yeah, I mean, yes, there was there was humor bits and then non humor bits, but it wasn't just this. It wasn't just this one character. It was comic relief done through all the different characters that suited their their unique um, yeah. aspect of the character. So Poe putting Hux on hold. There was, was a, a reason for that. That was an amazing moment for Poe. It wasn't just a joke. Well, that's and, got balls there. He had balls. He was one X-Wing against a Dreadnought. He could have been swatted out of the sky like nothing. But doing that trick, doing the fact that he was on the intercom and holding Hux at bay, just wasting time, yeah. if he hadn't done that, they would have blown him out of the sky and he would have failed his mission. Yeah. And it was also hilarious. Yeah. That's the point we're trying to make. Yeah. And that, that's ultimately... I mean, this it boils down to taste. If you don't like it, you're not wrong. But I, I feel like it actually fit really well. I agree. I know, and I know that's going to draw ire in the comment section, but that's that that's really where I'm coming from with that. Anyway, let's move on. Write let's... really long comments because he has to read every single one. Yeah, thanks for that, man. <laughs> let's move on to some interesting points. Now, these are a couple of things that I found quite interesting. Yes. Um, uh, Billy Lord. Now, Billy Lord is Carrie Fisher's daughter. Oh. Now... You may have recognized her as that female lieutenant who is in a lot of the shots. And like, who the hell is this character? I mean, we saw her a bit in the last film, but now she's a main character. What is this? That's Carrie Fish's daughter. Oh. So that was very, very sweet that she was in that. Oh. Yeah. Oh, I didn't you know, didn't that. know that, did you? No, I don't no, know that. There we go. Uh, yeah. A lot of people don't know that because her last name is not Fisher. Mm. Um, she's known as, as now as an actress, but also as a model. And of course, a, lo- a long line of Fishers. Yes. That- Daughter of Debbie Reynolds. Being, yes, exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yes. Uh, and Eddie Fisher, the uh, the singer slash um, uh, 
quagmire of the 1950s. i got to say, just as an aside, people, I've just closed the window because the cicadas outside. It is now boiling hot. <laughs> it's a little warm, yeah. I, I cannot win the Australian Australia. summer. Australia is... And the, it's nine o'clock at night. <laughs> oh, my... <laughs> No. Oh, you you have okay. You Americans just have no idea. No, no. <laughs> I'm not saying you. you, you maybe yeah. you, you guys in Texas. You're okay. Yeah, maybe. <laughs> maybe. <laughs> you guys in Texas. Uh, the other yeah, the other thing is is uh, you may you know you got hints that Billy Lord is is related to Carrie Fisher. They never sort of got, you know had scenes that far together in the films. But she had hairstyles reminiscent of Princess Leia. Oh, okay. So you get little hints like that. And I, I for one, thought it was very sweet. And I hope she's... Uh, I really liked her character. She didn't overplay it. She didn't underplay it. I hope she's in the next film. Excellent. Well, look, when I rewatch it, I'm going to look out for that. There you go. And she's again, she's in Force Awakens uh, as well, like just as in the background. Indeed. She's, yeah. Uh, another bit that I thought was very interesting, the dice that he had, mm. that, he, yeah, that uh, Luke gets from the Neem Falcon. That's Han's dice. Now, in the extended universe, which is again legends now, it's, it's non-canon. Mm, um, mm. The the story goes that was the the Sabak dice that uh, he won the Falcon. With. Really? Yeah. Now I knew I, I worked out it was Han's dice. Who else would it be? Yeah. I didn't know that. Yeah. That's so he really used cool. it was a version of Sabak that he played. To We're going to see it in the Han Solo film. Yes. Oh, that's so cool. <laughs> yes. And that uh, hopefully... My brain is exploding. <laughs> hopefully that's the reason that they put them there. Now, I was talking it to is. a buddy of mine. It is so So we can... You know, we can yeah. Recognize and our buddy of mine was like, I didn't get that at all. I said, well, yeah, I, I'm, I'm a huge dork. So I got that part. Um, oh, wow. Well, you, you knew that was Hans, but you didn't get that backstory. Oh, the other thing that's is... That's beautiful. That is beautiful. They've, they've appeared in the film before. They were in A New Hope. Those dice were they? Yeah. Oh, go back and watch it. Maybe put a screen grab on the up on the on the film. If you look at the first time you see inside the cockpit, they're just hanging up there, little tiny dice at the very top. Oh, only in a New Hope, and only at the first time you're in the cockpit. I don't think they're in the rest of the film, and they're definitely not in Empire, and they're definitely not in Jedi. Did I mention Matt's a massive Star Wars fan? <laughs> <laughs> I did at the start of the film. Oh, yes, yeah. uh, and also you may not have seen it because. VHS copies didn't show it up, but now you get the extra super special Blu-ray edition with like walking, talking Jabber. But you've also got the dice that you can see, and they were there as a joke from the prop department that Han Solo was like, you know, he's a rebel on the street. He's got a fluffy dice. We can't have fluffy dice. Let's make them Star Warsy. That was good. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. So okay. there you go. That's lovely. That's lovely. Now the other thing that I found was really cool, and this again is going to show off how much of a huge nerd I am. Um, is... You're amongst friends. <laughs> <laughs> um, is on Acto in uh, Luke Skywalker's hut. Now, this one gets quite nerdy. Um, talking about Han Solo's dice. Yeah, cool. This is going to get quite nerdy. Yeah, cool. In Acto, there's a whole bunch of his trinkets and stuff on the table. Mm -hmm. And there's a medallion with a crystal in it. Now, if you get the, <laughs> the Last Jedi visual dictionary that has come out... Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, sorry. And if you go into that and you look up the, the trinkets and it shows what's on there... There is the prop, which is uh, um, a, uh, a a Sith or a Jedi Crusader lightsaber crystal. Now, in the extended universe, there has only ever been one person referred to as a Jedi Crusader. That was Darth Revan. Uh, yes. Are we talking um, not the Republic or? Yes. Oh right, I got it right. Well done. Wow, go me. <laughs> so that's Darth Revan. Uh, talking four thousand, I think four thousand or three thousand years before Battle of Yavin. Yes. Okay. So he, it was him and uh, he was a Jedi. He turned, sorry, yeah, Jedi he turned uh, to be a Sith. And uh, he, he had another disciple called Doth Malak. And then he turned back to being a Jedi and they fought and, Mal and uh, Revan lost. And that was big bad, all that sort of stuff. And then he inspired Darth Bane to come up with the rule of two, which is why there's always two Sith. Mm. That was thrown away with the legends. But now that that crystal's in there and it's shown as a Jedi's Crusader crystal... That's kind of hinting Darth Revan might be coming back into the into the canon. Yeah, and we've seen okay. Darth Bane, we've seen Darth Bane appear in Clone Wars as a um, and Revan actually uh, as a ghost that um, Yoda talks to. Not for very long, I think. Yeah. From, I think from memory, he talks to Bane, and Revan is sort of in the background. The fact that Bane was very very much inspired by Revan. Brings all that stuff in. So Legends, they didn't throw away everything. They're keeping things they like. I will say on the back of that note, though, um, Clone Wars and Rebels often do a lot in just... They, they play fast and loose with the canon. Yeah, yeah. They, they, they nod to old EU stuff because we know we like it, but they are... 
they are rarely responsible for bringing it into accepted no. canon, and that's no. and that's fair enough. I mean, the only, the one exception to that is Saul Gerrera, who yes. appeared first in Clone Wars. Having said that, Saul Gerrera and did Chop- not Chopper the Droid because he shows up in. Um... Uh, Rogue One, yes, and also Sindor, but that was that was in reference to the show that already exists. Yes. It, it, that's a bit of a different thing. Um, what were we talking about? Oh, Darth Revan's lightsaber crystal. Yes, yes. in the yeah, it's um, it's very interesting. And, and from that point of view, I don't know if it's just meant to be a nod, yeah, or they're actually talking about something. And it, it could be it's, a it's a really cool thing they did. And look, we know that there's a new trilogy on the horizon. Well, Rain Rain Johnson's been given his own trilogy now. Yeah, and. I mean, it could be about the Old Republic. It could be about armies of Sith and Jedi fighting each other. Yeah. Which, whoo, that'd be great. That'd be say, great. Uh, those of you who are interested in the extended universe, uh, again, not canon anymore, but they were great. Uh, start at the Timothy Zahn trilogy and also uh, the Darth Bane trilogy, which goes through a lot of the Revan stuff, a lot of why the Sith are. It's very rare you get stuff from the Sith's point of view, and this is why the Sith are the way they are, which is really interesting, and it's very much their deception, their way of playing against the Jedi, which which helps the prequels, because a lot of people hate the prequels, and I'm, I'm not really a massive fan of them myself. But <laughs> you can... let, let's, um, let's go with that. Let's go with that. <laughs> but having read these books and then going back to the prequels, I can go, okay, cool. The Jedi there, that's why they failed, because they were very content being where they were. They were sort of big in charge and all that sort of oh, stuff. Oh, yeah. And that's why they failed, and that was very interesting. I mean, I agree with you. The overall story of the prequels was fine, just the execution was the issue. Um, let, let's not go into that now, because we can spend an entire three hours talking about and our gripe with the prequels. Again, yeah. on the lightsaber crystal, when I was compiling this list, uh, we both compiled a couple of lists about what to talk about this one. My phone discovered that... Um, it recognizes lightsaber as a word. Of course. If I wrote Jedi or I wrote Sith, they were both automatically capitalized. Mm-hmm. It did not recognize the word X-Wing. Fair enough. Did you put the little um, dash in between X and Oh. And it still did not recognize it. It, it, saw, it thought I meant swing. Very good. Yes. Very good. Okay, let, let's move on um, because we've been rambling for a very long time. Not that I have any issue with anything we've said so far, but there are there are two main overarching themes I want to talk about in this movie and this this to me is what ties together the film and it actually draws upon a lot of things that people did not like about the film and the first thing I want to talk about is well let, let's take one of these key things people don't like they don't like Finn because Finn and Rose's story was quote unquote inconsequential I disagree I disagree very much because one of the overarching themes of The Last Jedi and I would say probably one of the most important themes is failure. Failure, as a th- it seems odd now that I say it out loud, but it is about the, st- the very real struggle of all of these characters. And they try to achieve all these different goals and they are constantly getting in each other's way. Not just Resistance, First Order as well. Um, uh, Snoke, Kylo and Hux all try to kill each other at some point. One of them actually succeeds. Yes. Um, and with the Resistance, they're all trying to achieve this goal of saving the Resistance, and they actively step on each other's toes. The whole... Um, too many cooks. Too, too many cooks. And Poe actually takes over the bridge of the ship, and then Hondo does the whole thing, and then Leia comes back and stuns Poe. And it was... And Leia was wearing white and a white headscarf, which is like when she stunned a stormtrooper in, the, in A New Hope. Oh. Which is quite a little, nice little Oh, that's a nice little yeah. thing. Again, you're, you're, you're good at this. Huge talk. <laughs> Absolutely. And and a lot of people said, well, it was to the detriment. Look at all the different things. Like, if they didn't get DJ, they wouldn't have seen the ships and they wouldn't have killed the ships. That's my point. It's not meant to be... As, these are not success stories. They are not supposed to be success stories. Well, yeah, you don't have triumph without adversity. Absolutely. And the whole thing is, all of these characters are stepping on each other's toes. And it's a way that's indicative to the characters. But it's about utter failure. It's not just the good guys. It's the bad guys too. And what is so powerful to these characters is not just the humour. But it is these characters experiencing real, utter failure... And how they deal with it. Mm. And that is a big overarching theme. Like, what did Finn do when he failed? He killed Phasma. Yeah. Who was, if you watch Force Awakens again, he is in quaking in his little boots. Don't tell me Finn's arc is not relevant. Mm. It is. It is in a big way. I know he didn't he didn't set out on his whole thing. He didn't he didn't achieve the whole thing of getting the shields down. I, I get that. Yeah. But him as a character, wow. 
Mm. That that was so powerful. Yes. Um. So and that, and that whole thing with DJ, like what that what that story meant for Finn and for Rose, not just them as a relationship and them falling in love, but them as characters, showing their characters off, was so utterly powerful. And it culminates in Finn being ready to sacrifice himself. Now I know he failed in doing that as well, <laughs> and which is a bit of a. A running kind of joke, which I was happy about. To be honest, I'm like, oh, I don't, no, no, no. Finn's one of the best characters. Yeah. Don't do that. Don't, don't do, do that. It. No. Um, but, but then to have Rose save him, and then to explain to him, what's the point of us doing this if everything we love just goes away? Which is very interesting because Winston Churchill said that in World War Two. Yeah. What's the point in doing all this if we just lose ourselves? Yeah, because there were, and that was in reference to them cutting the arts programs. Um, to pay for more How work. do you know this stuff? <laughs> Eidetic memory. I guess so, wow. But no, um, he, it, was a, it was an arts program they were going to cut, and then Winston Churchill said, well, why are we, what are we fighting for? Exactly right. And, and this is what I want to say. Everyone failed. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Hondo failed because, uh, obviously, her, her plan didn't go so well. Poe failed because he basically did... A, he tried to achieve something which just never happened. Yes. Finn failed because he ultimately uh, took this hacker... To the resistance, slicer. It's a slicer. Slicer, in Star Wars. not to the sorry, uh, to the first order, yeah. who ended up telling them that there yeah. were these cloaked transports going away. Everyone failed. Everyone failed, but one person succeeded hard, Luke. Hmm. And that's and that's what this boils Legend. down. Legend, <laughs> legend. And not to say Luke didn't fail. Oh, Luke failed catastrophically. He failed in, Kylo Ren. He, he failed all his students. He created the Knights of Ren, arguably. Absolutely. Who I was a bit annoyed we didn't see more of, but I'm that's the next that's the next movie. That that is that is the that'll be the hierarchy of the first order, is mm. is Kylo at the top with all the Knights of Ren. That's gonna be sick. But but that Luke but that Luke character failed and But they had to, because at the end of it again, you we had we've seen the rebellion go from strength to strength to strength, and now they fit inside a small freighter. The entire rebellion is in one star cruiser. Yeah, the, as they keep saying, the tiniest spark can light the flame, which lights the rebellion. I know, I know. Um, I get goosebumps saying that. <laughs> <laughs> and just bring, and this is just coming back to Luke's death. Um, the whole thing with what Luke did, he atoned. Mm. He atoned big time, and it worked. Luke's <laughs> what Luke did juxtaposes so well against Snoke. Mm. You had the big. The big bad dude and the big good dude. Snoke died in anger. He died yelling at Kylo, telling him, you know, you know, cracking that whip, going, you got to kill her, you got to kill her. And he ends up being killed because he is so arrogant. Hmm. Luke is the exact opposite. He does exactly what he needs to do. He, he dies because he does the right he thing. He gives everything he can. And he dies. They actually say, point blank, he dies in peace. I don't think they had to say that. No, that but, was a bit on the nose. But however, I, I get it, you know... Di- not everyone's going to go away dissecting the characters like we do. Some yes. people do need it spelled out for them, and I completely understand that. But that's ultimately what it comes down to. The whole failure is a theme in this movie is just so crucial. And it's not only about failure on all the characters, it's also about the one character that succeeds. And And this is where I want to end this discussion, the arc of Luke Skywalker. Because to me, this is the most poignant and powerful arc in the entire film. Not to say that other character arcs weren't good. Uh, Finn was great. Poe was great. Ray, Ray, I was a bit disappointed with. I felt like they could have done more with that character. Um, even Kylo and Hux, I like what they did with those characters. Mm. But Luke was easily the most significant, in my opinion. Um, this is such a point of salt for a lot of people, and I mm, <laughs> salt. <laughs> yes. Oh man, I, I, that's going to be the thumbnail for this. Oh, um, yeah. for this. <laughs> For oh, yeah. this um, whole um, discussion, just say so you no. Know. People had certain expectations about what Luke should have been. He, you know, he he is a war hero. Um, he was a war hero. More yeah, importantly, yeah. Um, and I just want to say, I look at what they did with Luke in this movie, and I, I feel it's all very justified. And I know that that's going to be that's going. People are going to hear that and go, "Whoa, what are you talking about, Nick? They completely screwed him up." We have to appreciate the fact that Luke always butted against the Jedi. He always defied Obi-Wan. He always defied Yoda. And that's why he succeeded. 
Um, it was actually this is actually part of a bigger arc overall. We could we could call this the Skywalker arc. Yeah, because Anakin did the same. This thing. calls back to Anakin, and this again is one of the better parts of the prequels. Episode three is not a movie that I enjoyed overall, but I loved Anakin turning. Um, yes, it, it took me a few watches to really get into that, but the Palpatine story and Anakin turning. It was about um, Anakin realizing that the Jedi were not something. What what's that word when you're just good for the sake of good? Um, uh, altruistic. Oh, altruistic. The Jedi were not just altruistic. They, you know, when seeing Mace Windu about to kill the 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 Emperor, it was that moment where where Anakin went, "What? Yeah, wait, we can do that? No, I, I, I was following this because you guys weren't like that, and that's ultimately what pushed him over the edge." And Luke defied the Jedi openly. He defied them because he cared about his friends. He defied them because he cared about his father. Um, turning Vader was the most significant thing he could have done in Return of the Jedi. It was the most powerful thing any character did in that movie. And it was in open and direct defiance of the two um, Jedi Masters that he was being controlled by. Yeah. Or being trained by, rather. They don't control him, obviously. And this is that the whole know thing. of. <laughs> yeah, let's go with that. After Return of the Jedi, there is only one Jedi left, Luke. And he... No, s- there is another. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Matt. Um, but Luke starts a Jedi school. I, I, I reluctantly. Do not, that's the thing. I don't believe for a second he was excited about having to do that. Because he was the only one that could do it. And this is the whole thing with He's him. He's got his Jedi texts. This is, yeah, this is why he goes away and looks after the books and the temple and mm. that kind of stuff. He feels this... His old religion has to die, but it's still reverence to it. He's got to take. He has to be the one to be the overwatcher of it. But he doesn't like having to do it. No. And in the end, he that just culminates in him wanting to actively destroy the books, which mm, leads to the page turners. They are not. Yeah, page turners. They are not. That's right. And it, it's ultimately this entire absolute resentment of what he has to do, culminating to the point where he almost created the next Vader. You know, you know, screw that. He did create the next phase. Yeah. Absolutely. Um, and I like pe- how Snoke told him to took his mask off, though. That was good. Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> well, that, that, that was good. That's another thing we can talk about. That was the point where Kylo <gasps> stopped being a Vader fanboy and started being his own character. Yes. Um, very quite obviously. But people ask, why did Luke just stay on this island for hundreds, for hundreds of years? For like tens of years. The, Decades the, is the word you're looking for? Probably about, probably about 10 years, come to think of it. Um, but my answer to that is, is because his active involvement in the New Republic, in rebuilding the Jedi, undid everything he fought so hard to achieve. It's like, why did he stay there? Why didn't he help? Because his help actively hurt the cause. He doesn't want to do it again. He doesn't want to go there. He doesn't want to be there. Um, you know, you, you saw the, the utter emotion at the end of Return of the Jedi, and I... The, the, the fight scene in the end of Return of the Jedi is my favourite lightsaber battle out of all of them. I, that is yet to be topped. Um, the, the, as good as the whole Rey and Kylo fighting the guards were, no, nowhere near. Yep. Um, th- that, that was cool. Like, was like cool. Vader actively trying to break Luke and, and like... And you him, can see the stars. You can see the, the rage and the, him, the, the power. Yeah, actually, actually almost turning right at the end there. Yeah. Luke... I mean, that's why he freaked out. That's why he turned on his lightsaber while Kylo was asleep. It's because, oh, remember that? I don't want that to happen. No. That's that's bad. Let's talk about that again. Let, let see in the flashback. I was going to say, you know, we've had Robo Tarkin. Yeah. We've had Robo Leia. I really like the de-aging effect they did on Hamill. Yeah? It looked real. They did the de-aging effect on him? Yes. Watch the scene again. Wow. He, he looks, okay. He looks... Far younger. He look. He doesn't look as young as he did in the old films. Well, did the same effect happen when he was projecting himself at the end of the film? Well done. Yeah. He had a different beard, which is why it triggered to me. I'm like, he's holding his lightsaber, and he's got a beard. Something's not right. And he had the blue lightsaber as well. Yeah. Yes. Um, by the way, in case any of you guys are wondering why he actively made himself look different, is because he wanted to make himself look the way he did the last time he saw Kylo. Mm. It wasn't significant because he was trying to save the rebellion or anything like that. It was about sending a message to Kylo. Mm. Um, I mean, obviously, saving the rebellion was significant, but um, there is a reason he looks like he did the last time he saw Kylo in that scene. It's very poignant and very purposeful. And that that moment where he almost kills Kylo, Kylo is um, it's, it's so powerful. I love how it's told from different point of views, bit by bit. First, well, first of I all, I told you the truth. 
From a certain point of view. Yeah, first of all, it's Kylo just attacking Luke. Second of all, it's Luke just attacking Kylo. Yeah. Third of all, it's Luke having a moment of weakness and then Kylo freaking out. Yes. And I like how it plays with your emotions going through that scene three times. Yes. Um, yeah, and that, you're right. That was that was fantastic. And you got to remember, um, Vader was not Luke's father. Anakin was Luke's father. And Va- Vader was, was not so much a person, but a symbol of what was taken away from him. And that's what he saw in Ben. He saw his family member being taken away from him. He saw his family member becoming everything he sought to destroy. And it just and him being directly responsible. Hmm. And this is what it boils down to. It, it, it spawns from both his utter failure and his resentment of the Jedi. Um, and from that point of view, I, I don't begrudge what happened to Luke. I don't begrudge the way they portrayed him. It was brilliant. Yeah. I actually think this is the way to portray Luke in this story. 10 out of 10 would Jedi again. Yeah. Absolutely. And the way he redeemed himself, um, the way he went out like an utter legend. Um, Dusting himself off after a massive, yeah. like a crater had been hit. <laughs> oh my God. That was amazing. By the way, um, have you ever read the Vader comics from Marvel? Uh, no. That kind of happens to Vader, but instead Vader's like blocking everything. Like, yeah. like, like they have just cannons surrounding him and he just... Does not care. One of the current novels has um, the... Uh, what's the Twilight plant? Ryloth. Um, the Ryloth Civil War. And the, the Empire and that. And there's there's uh, Vader and Palpatine on that. Fantastic. There's a scene in that where Vader just sort of... Okay, cool. I'm just going to go attack that ship. My ship doesn't work. He crashes his fighter into the ship. His, sh- his uh, armor is pressurized. So he just walks out into space. Cuts a hole in the side of the ship. Walks in. The vacuum's going out. He walks into the next door. Hi, guys. Yeah, pretty much. <laughs> and then you get it from... So he walks onto the ship, goes into an airlock, and then wanders off. Then you go onto the bridge, and you're hearing from another ship them talking, going, oh, there's a big pressure lock. You guys go find that. Well, that was a weird noise. You guys go follow them. <laughs> yeah. yeah. You guys follow them. Oh, crap. Oh, crap. He's coming. He's coming. Guys, get out of here. Guys, get out of here. Oh, God. And then you can hear him come through the ship, and he's just this terrifying force of nature. Yeah, and and Darth Vader was a legend. Yes, and and it's it's almost like they made a point of giving Luke that same gravitas. I mean, Luke had gravitas in the old films, but it wasn't these legendary abilities that just make you just gawk at the screen yeah. until this movie. Um, and that's just so powerful. It's it's almost the antithesis of Vader. What we saw in this. And I know it really challenges people. I I get that his death is really hard to deal with. I get that because we're we're having trouble with dealing with it as well. I I get that him not being an absolute war hero, just swashbuckling like a madman, is hard to deal with. But I gotta say, the fact that it challenges me, and I don't just reject it outright, and I actually understand it, is so powerful. And for to me, I I, I love the whole theme of failure, but. Ending the Skywalker arc was incredible, and I, I absolutely love this to the core. Well, again, the more he, I think about it, the more I love it. Luke Skywalker, to many of us, is he's he's a, a pinnacle of pop culture. He is, it's like losing a family member in this case, where yeah, a, a, a family member who who has been around for so long, we, we we enjoy that. We're sad that he's gone, but we're not completely sad. I mean, that he's moved on into peace, and that. He brings us joy. We, we were able to see what Luke Skywalker, like what Luke Skywalker did. Skook Lightwalker, Skook Lightwalker. <laughs> that bloke, he was he was in the band in the cantina. <laughs> Skook Lightwalker. Yeah, I love that. Um, yeah, yeah. Well put. Well yes. put. Um, and last of all, to finish off this immense review of the last Jedi. Well, thank you for coming through with us. Um, let's um, let's talk about the ending of the film because yes. this is something a lot of people are talking about. I'd like you to. Describe to me that child with the broom. What's going on, Matt? Tell us about it. The child walks out from the stables. He's, you know, he's playing with his friends. They're telling the story, much like 3PO was telling the Ewoks. He's telling a little story about Luke Skywalker standing out there. The stable master comes in and beats them. and, and throw, they're, they're slaves. They're the lowest of the low. They're you know, on the opposite of well, the end of that wealthy casino world. And the kid runs out to go to his chores. And this was missed by a bunch of people I've spoken to. He just casually grabs the broom from the wall, using, using the, the force. force. Yeah, which I, when I saw it, it was so subtle. I was like, "Did I see that?" I I didn't. I was like, mm. "Did I see that happen?" And again, a lot of my friends who I've spoken to didn't see that. Yeah, they they were like, "Oh, I hate that kid. Why is he? Why is he ending the film?" Um, but he grabs. He uses it very very casually. He's not a Jedi or anything. He's just he's force sensitive. He's got this, and then he sees 
a spaceship go off in, in the sky. And he turns the ring that Rose had given him, that, that they used to have in Coruscant, in the, in the halls, to signify that they were a part of the underground. They were part of the rebellion. Mm. And he's got that. So he's, he's the spark of the rebellion. He's the spark of the Jedi. They are intertwined. And he holds the broom as a lightsaber as he looks up in the star, like we all do. Exactly. The way I view this kid, and I think th- th- it, it comes back to Skywalker, it, it is everything we understand about Skywalker. He is a he is a child that in 1977 watched Star Wars and then in his room, in his underpants, was holding a broom like a lightsaber. He is the child in all of us that watched Star Wars for the first time yeah. and had that emotional response. I remember doing that with a tennis racket. Yeah, for sure. Um, and that's what... that. It's, it's, there's no coincidence that that happened right before Luke Skywalker died. Yeah. So, sorry, right after Luke Skywalker died, I should say. I mean, obviously, yes, the ring and him using the Force was significant. But uh, again, that's just the kid wanting to go, I can make the broom come to me yeah. if I just believe hard enough. So it, I, I'm all the way down here, but they're up there, and one day I'll be up there. Ever jumped in front of automatic doors and went, shh, with your hand? <laughs> Almost every time. Of course. We still do it. We yeah. still do it. And that's what this kid... I did that today. <laughs> the, this kid is the Star Wars fan that we were, the Star Wars fan that's inside of all of us. And I think it was a brilliant way of ending the film. Yeah. Uh, very, very the powerful. The spark... That lights the flame, that lights the rebellion. Yeah. That's what he wants. Absolutely. And that's what I want to end this whole review on. Um, I, what, again, I want to say, it's, it's, no, it's quite obvious that me and Matt both love this film. And I hope that we've given you some context as to why that is. Yeah, we haven't just said, yeah, it's great. Good night, everybody. Mm-hmm. We've explained our views. Uh, by all means, in the comments, uh, yell at us. But, <laughs> but we hope you'll see our You our don't points. read the comments. <laughs> you I don't. don't have to deal with but that. you do. And um, I just want to say, it, it, it's only taken us about an hour less than the entire film to do this. <laughs> <laughs> um, I but I, I, I could, I, there are more points in my head. I could genuinely take two hours and 40 minutes to explain the entire film yeah. and why it's significant to me. But ultimately, these are the key points we want to talk about. And yeah, that, it's what it boils down to. Um, anything else to say, Matt? It's the vibe. It's Marbo. It's, it's the whole thing. I love it. Absolutely. Thank you for coming in, Matt. And thank you all for staying with us. Like and subscribe, like the Facebook page, and I will catch you later. May the force be with you.